you can just point finger like this. So I will know that you are trying to show me something. Okay, but don't speak anything huh, because you are live. Yes, sir. The phone is outside? Yes, sir. Slide. Okay. Good evening and welcome to all to the first live interactive session of the course on lighter than air systems. I am the course instructor, Professor Rajkumar Pant, and uh, I welcome you all to this first session. Today's agenda is as follows. We are going to talk first about a very interesting competition called as the Airship Regatta. And notice I am saying Regatta 2.0 because this is the second version of the competition. Then whenever you talk about airships to anybody, we start uh, always talking about a very famous disaster called as the Hindenburg disaster. And because of this, many people think that airships are very unsafe or airships are not really uh, useful. But we will go into the depth of the Hindenburg disaster today and to understand the reasons behind it and also what lessons do we learn from the Hindenburg disaster. After that, I will request our teaching assistant, Mr. Namanuddin, to share if there are any questions from the Excel sheet. I will talk to you about the discussion forum which I believe is not being used very actively as much as we would have liked. And then we will take any feedback or suggestions or maybe even complaints about the course, about the instructor, about the teaching assistant, whatever. And finally, we will open up the field for any queries. So moving on to the airship regatta. Okay, so um, Namanuddin, I would like you to confirm to me that you are able to see the notification regarding the regatta 2.0. So friends, uh, Regatta 2.0 is being organized as part of the upcoming conference on the design and engineering of uh, LTA systems, which is in short called as Deltas 2024. Regatta 2.0 is an event where your creativity takes flight. It is a competition that has been internationally approved by two agencies. One is the Federation Aeronautical International and also by the Aero Club of India. So it was initially approved by the Aero Club of India or ACI and then it received the approval of the International Aero Modeling Federation. So the advantage of this is that this becomes an internationally acceptable competition and any record which is created in this regatta will be considered to be an Indian record and also the world record if you beat the world record. So as I mentioned to you, this is being conducted as part of that conference called Delta 2024 and the regatta is going to happen in our institute IIT Bombay on Sunday 30th June, exactly when we reach half of the year 2024. Okay. So please, please mark your calendars for Sunday 30th June when you can take part in the regatta and also you can come and witness the regatta. We are creating a special category of people who can simply come and enjoy the regatta by coming as attendees. So what is exactly a regatta? A regatta is basically an indoor flying competition. Okay. So, there are three steps in any regatta and especially in the airship regatta. The first step is design. So the job given to you in this regatta is to design an indoor remotely controlled airship. Now there is a question from Bhaskar about whether virtually attendable. The answer is no. No. We are not going to allow you to attend this virtually. We would rather like you to physically come to IIT Bombay. 
So how to become an attendee, I will show you very soon. So Bhaskar, be a bit patient. At the end of this presentation, you will know how to become an attendee. So let me just complete. So the competition consists of three steps. You can, the first step will be to design an indoor remotely controlled airship. An example is shown to you on the screen. This is an airship that was designed last year and it won the competition. The next one is build. In build, the teams are supposed to fabricate the design and they have to optimize the design for two conflicting requirements. One is to optimize it for high speed, so it should be a thin slender body and the other for maximizing the payload, which means it should be able to carry the largest amount of payload for a given volume. In other words, it should have least possible self-weight. So, the volume is going to be constant for everybody. We are going to put an upper limit on the envelope volume. Therefore, the team that builds an airship of a given volume with the least self-weight will be able to lift the largest amount of payload. So, that is the challenge in build. And the third one, of course, is fly, in which you are going to compete with teams coming from all over the world to create world records and to compete with them. Okay, so it's a design build fly competition. Now, Regatta 1.0 was held two years ago as part of the Delta 2022 conference on 26th June. Here are some glimpses from that particular competition. Here is one team which came from Punjab Engineering College. They are doing the final way off of their airship. Incidentally, the young lady that you see in the middle of this photograph, uh, her name is Akriti, and Akriti has now joined IIT Bombay as an MTech student. Then these are uh, two gentlemen who came from a company in Germany called as Roboloon. So Roboloon is a very interesting uh, airship concept. It is an airship which has nine engines. So you can see in the nose, you can see two engines. There are two on the other side. And then actually in the Roboloon airship, which I saw in Germany, there are another four on the back side and there is one on the extreme rear. So there are nine engines. This is a small airship based on the similar design. So they, com they competed last year in the regatta. This is another interesting airship. And you can see some airship flying. And these are the uh, teams at the end. Okay. So the airship regatta and competition which was held in 2022 it uh, saw the participation of many, many teams from all over the world. And I'm very happy to share with you that the team from India, from IIT Bombay, by a PhD student and an MTech student, that team actually won the first prize last time. Then there were many novices or young students who were trying to learn the tricks. So they had lots of experiences, some good, some bad. For example, this airship was continuously leaking in fact, many airships that were um, participating last time, they were leaking. So this time we have come up with an innovative solution to that problem, which I'll talk to you. So what is new this time? So this time, there are going to be two races. Last time, there were only one race. This time, we are planning two races. The first race, of course, is like any other race where we have the fastest time. So the teams are supposed to navigate a figure of eight course. There will be two pylons and you have to start from one end and you have to do three laps of figure of eight. So the team that does this successfully in the minimum time will win the first race. This race was also held last time. So it's a repeat of last time. Although the distance between the pylons may be reduced this time because of the change in the venue. The second race is going to be the fastest airship which can carry some payload over a particular course. So here the teams are going to race against time while carrying a specified payload or while carrying the largest amount of payload that they can carry. 
So the detailed problem statement is available on our website which you can obtain by scanning this particular QR. So this particular presentation is going to be available on YouTube after we finish today's session. So if you are interested, you can go ahead and you can scan it at leisure. Or you can do it now also to look at the problem statement. But moving ahead, why should you take part in the competition? What do you get? So there is a lot of money. The total cash prizes for this competition are 1.5 lakh rupees. So apart from having fun, apart from flying a remotely controlled indoor airship, apart from competing with other teams from all over the world, you also stand to gain huge cash prizes. Then all experts in this field from the globe are going to attend the conference before this regatta. So you will have a chance to meet professors, researchers, industry personnel uh, in the global community who work in the area of uh, airships and lighter than air systems. We will give you theoretical and practical support for building your airship. We are planning to conduct some online workshop where we will teach you. In fact, one of our workshop is already available online. Uh, but we will be happy to conduct sessions where after watching the videos online, you should be able to ask your queries and doubts. And if you need any practical help and support, we will be happy to help you out. Then, as I mentioned last time, several envelopes were leaking or the participants found it very difficult to build an envelope because they don't have the machines or they don't have the facility. So this year what we have done is we have already procured around 15 envelopes from a company in Germany that makes premium quality indoor airship envelopes. And you can simply purchase those envelopes at cost price from us. No need to build the envelope. You can focus on other than the envelope which means the fins, the motors, the control system, the remote receiver and all other items that you want to put on the airship. So, your work will be focused on the propulsion system and the remote control system and the control th system. The envelope you can actually directly get from us. So here is the envelope which is available. This is from a company called Windwriter and the volume of the envelope is around half cubic meter. To be precise it is 0.511 cubic meter. So let's assume that every team is going to get half cubic meter of helium. The envelope length you can see is 3.12 meter which is around 10 feet or more than 10 feet. The diameter is just above half meter, 0.57 uh, meters. Surface area is 4.1 square meters but the weight of the envelope is very less and the net lift available to you is 364 grams which means that this envelope can carry a total excess weight of 360 grams, keeping 4 grams as margin. So you have to fit your other things like receivers, battery, motor, etc. within about 360 grams. This is a huge challenge but it is very much doable because there are many quadcopter components available which can fit within that dimension and within that weight margin. So, the idea of uh, giving you the envelope at the cost price is to ensure that you do not break your head in trying to fabricate or design the envelope. We recommend that you buy the envelope from us and then configure it to meet your design requirements. The cost of the envelope is rupees 5000 plus GST which comes out to be 5,900 rupees and believe me this is the cost price at which we got it from Germany. We placed an advanced order and we will be happy to ship it to you. In fact, one college today, they actually sent a person to pick up the envelope in person. So one envelope has gone today in person. Now here is the registration fee information. So we request you to join the competition much early. If you do it before 26th March, the charges will be only 5000 rupees per team which basically is uh, applicable for a team of maximum 4 people. Okay. So it's around 1200 rupees 
per person for a team of four. And if you delay the registration, then the cost will become rupees six thousand five hundred. These costs are already inclusive of GST, so nothing else to be paid. And as Bhaskar was asking me how to become an attendee, here is the answer. On our website, very soon you will be able to register as an attendee, through which you will be able to come here. Now we are trying to arrange accommodation for outstation people. in the hostel in iit bombay but that will be at an additional payment basis i don't know how much they will charge because the charges are not in my hands roughly the charge is 150 rupees per person per day so we recommend that you attend the entire conference uh, and we are going to do many many workshops in the competition there is going to be a, a competition before the conference there is going to be a competition or a workshop during the conference and then there is this regatta however if you choose to attend only the regatta and if you want to come for say some other days it's going to cost you 1000 rupees per day okay so i have mentioned the email address of the contact person on the bottom he is a phd student at iit bombay monash research academy feel free to send an email to him and if you have any further doubts you can also scan these qr codes we have an interest form we would request people to fill that interest form so that we know how many people are interested so you can scan this qr to get a google form which will be used by us just to know how many people are interested and uh, for any further queries either you can contact namanuddin on the discussion forum or you can send a mail to yash desle as i have mentioned so that's all i wanted to do here is our website which contains the details of the regatta it's called as regatta 2.0 so feel free to check out our website and when the time comes you can also register for either the whole conference or only for the regatta as you please So at this point of time, I am going to open the floor for some queries or questions that you may have in your mind. So the floor is open. Please ask your queries. Okay, so uh, moving on, we will look at uh, the question which have been asked in the forum. There, are, I see there are about two or three questions. So uh, the first question is by Ashwin Rai. Anyway, let us let us just go ahead first. Okay. So uh, when we made this presentation, there were no queries, but now I think there are three queries. See, all of them have come late in the evening. So. the first uh, question from uh, ashwin raj is um, you know what is the scope of lds system in career perspectives okay so look uh, lds systems are a new type of systems in the aerospace industry so at the moment there are no established companies in india which are uh, hiring people or looking for people with lds systems experience however i know there are many startups which have come up i am personally also supporting and encouraging and mentoring some startups uh, plus there are some companies which have come up now in india in a very big way and they are planning in fact i know one of them which has also hired a few people and they are desperate to be looking for people with good lta background so yes there is some career scope in fact this is a field where you can think of opening a startup because it's a brand new field how to find out innovative trends of lts systems the source website journals particularly or at least focus on lts systems so one way is to attend our conference uh, we in 2022 conducted the first dedicated conference in this area in india and uh, there were i think uh, a large number of uh, 
people who came from so many countries. You can see on the website, you will see uh, more than 10 countries, I think, were represented in our conference. Uh, and there were uh, around 25 papers and posters presented. This year, the response is far more, and we are now going to actually struggle how to fit in the number of papers. So this is one way. Application-oriented trends of LTS systems, okay. LTS systems have certain features which are positive and they have certain limitations. So if you can focus on extracting the positive features of LTS systems and somehow trying to handle the negative systems, then you will get a very challenging and a very promising or a product with great potential. So therefore, it is not a problem. Uh, so now there is a question regarding the assignments and the examination. So he says, he says, he has missed three assignments. Can I still get through the average score for covering the right examination? Uh, yeah. So look, you are right that you can miss up to four assignments because we take the best eight out of 12 assignments. There will be a total of 12 assignments. You can miss four because eight are minimum required. Uh, although if you score very high in maybe seven assignments, you can still get a very good score. If I am not right, if I am not wrong, the passing marks are I think 40 percent. So your score should be individually 40 percent in the assignments. Okay. How does the performance parameter differ from HTS system? For this, I think you need to look at the presentation which I have given in the course. I have a dedicated session where I talk about the differences between LDS system and HTS system. This is not the forum to ask questions or queries which are already answered in the course. Is there a possibility that we can find out some similarities or relatable equations between performance for each system of several LDS systems? I mean equations for solid and hollow shaft like that kind of relatability. Yes, it is possible. When you replace the airship with a point mass, then the equations are applicable same. After all, if you look at performance calculations, we normally don't bother about the detail uh, of the structure or detail of the aerodynamics. We just look at the aerodynamic coefficients, CL, CM, CD, and use them in the calculation. So what do you need? You need the weight of the body and you need the CL, CM, CD variation with alpha and beta. Once you have that, you forget about the body and do it like a point mass equation. So therefore, then the equations are all valid for the various types of bodies. Market value and scope for a delivery system and space storage management and use of these LTS as homes. Well, you cannot use them as a home because it will be too expensive to continuously stay afloat up in the air. Okay? But you can use them for evacuation purposes and they can also be used for aerial surveillance so that uh, the damage can be assessed and the corrective measures can be taken. Could you just check the other questions? <coughs> Just click on this, this question will go. Uh, Noman, is there any other question that uh, is there which I need to answer? Okay, so can smaller airships with payload attached to them be used as a source of in-flight collectible ballast for larger airship by detaching the payload from the smaller airships as an event required and loading it on the larger airship. Yes, you can do this, but it is going to be a bit complicated. So, although I will not say not doable, I would definitely say this is possible, but it is a it is slightly a complicated system. Because, you know, when you have LTA systems and when you take some payload in it, it will change its balance and when you release the payload to the bigger airship again there will be change in the balance. So when you have loss of payload during flight in LDO systems you can have some problems with the balance. So one has to do that system carefully. So let's see if there is any other question. Okay, so Namanuddin has given the criteria for certificate. Okay. So these informations are already available on the NPTEL web page. You should read there and you will get uh, the information there. Okay, so moving on. Let's go to the Hindenburg disaster. Okay. 
So, okay, Bhaskar has a question. Can we make LTF systems that suddenly inflate and perform its function in outer space? Bhaskar, the answer is yes. And right now, as I speak to you, I am working on the design of such a system. I am so glad you asked this question because this idea came to us also. And we are lucky that we have been given a kind of a project to do this work. I will not be able to give any details because it's uh, not to be there in public or in open literature. But believe me, we are working on a system like that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we will monitor the question uh, session, but I'll continue with the presentation about the air disaster. So, this is the history of LTF flight which you already have in your uh, notes. The whole um, field began with the Montgolfier brothers with their balloon in 1783. And then in 1852, there was the first manned airship by Henry Giffard and also the airship called La France. Okay. So, these were very primitive, unstable balloons initially. And the steering of these balloons was nearly impossible. Okay. Plus, they use hydrogen, which is uh, a fire hazard. Okay. Then, a company called Zeppelin from Germany, they came into being and they perfected the design of airships by early 1900s. And they are the considered to be the pioneers of the LTA aviation industry. You can see this is the first airship LZ-1, which they made in 1901. And then this is another very famous airship called as the Graf Zeppelin. So you can see there are suspended carriages where there is a power plant and uh, there are seating areas which are inside the airship and in the front you have the gondola. Okay. So Zeppelin used hydrogen filled airships. Helium was available at that time but helium was in short supply because it was produced only at certain locations in the world and very soon they realized that this is a strategic item so they put an embargo. Okay. So UK, USA and France they were using hydrogen airships and they found them to be too dangerous because you can see many many accidents took place right from 1917 to 1930. Okay, So many accidents took place. Now, Germany, on the other hand, they, they had a flawless record. Now, all these accidents except LZ-104 uh, are taking place in Europe and USA. Germany had a flawless record with hydrogen airships. Okay, They are very good. Uh, if you look at the Hindenburg airship, it had more than 10 successful transatlantic trips till 1936. This was an airship which was funded by the government, by the Nazi party. Okay. So, it is considered as the Concorde of 1930s because the next best option available was Titanic which was taking 7 days. It was too slow. The, uh, you know, the airship Hindenburg used to take only 3 to 4 days. So, it was double the speed or better of the best ship available during that time. Okay. So Hindenburg consisted of a rigid structure with 16 hydrogen gas cells mounted inside. These cells are mounted so that they create separate partitions for the gas. So in case there is a leakage of only one or two chambers, the whole airship does not lose lift. Okay. They use a very thin plastic film and it was hydrogen filled. Right? Look at the skeleton. So the, it, was a, it was a rigid structure which had a rigid framework like this and in the center there is a keel which is used to give it strength and also allow people to walk inside for attending to the airship and to do any repairs. Okay. So it was steel bracing. So the wires that you see are all wires of steel. Okay. And the engine mounted outside on some small gondola which were attached. As you can see in this picture, this is one engine, this is one engine. It is mounted outside the airship. As you can see here also in this picture, they are attached to the airship uh, structure and mounted outside. Right. 
Now, the skin was basically cotton and leather material, and it was uh, to be very specific. It was cellulose acetate butyrate, plus there was an aluminium coating to give it uh, waterproofing and to protect the gas bags from the infrared radiation from the sun. Now, little did they realize that this aluminium coating or Al2O3 coating actually makes it highly, highly inflammable. Okay. So, this becomes incendiary. Now, what happened in the fateful flight? It was a flight which took off from Germany and it was supposed to land at New Jersey. Right? There were 36 passengers and 61 crew members. So there were a large number of crew members compared to passengers. And it was a journey lasting three and a half days. Now, throughout the flight, there were constant headwinds or winds which come from the front. And because of that, there is increased amount of drag force. So, there was a considerable delay in the flight because it was continuously encountering headwind. As it approached the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst in New Jersey, okay, it was supposed to attach itself to the mooring mast and to land. So the flying mode landing basically is a landing in which the airship doesn't come to the ground. It just comes and flies and attaches itself to a huge mast. And after that, the you know the the tail portion is lowered and then you slowly allow the passengers to come out. Okay. It's a time consuming process, it's a slow process, and they were late, and the pilot, the captain and the crew were very anxious to land quickly. But during the approach, the weather becomes bad. There were thunderstorms, there was lightning. Okay, I'll show you a small video of how it all approached. Okay, so you can see this is the airship approaching. It first went through the two masts, then it took a very sharp turn, and then took another sharp turn and tried to align itself and come and attach itself to the mast. This was the path. Okay. So, 7 o'clock, first pass over landing, then circle around. Again, bad weather became intensified. So, then it again began dumping. So, what it did is to reduce the weight, it started dumping hydrogen from the front and water from the rear. It took a sharp turn. At this point, it exploded and caught fire. So you can see the video. <clears throat> this is an aerial photograph recorded from an aircraft which is flying. When these big airships used to come, they used to make big news and therefore a lot of people used to gather to see the airships. Here you can see the engines which are outside the airship on the gondola. And you can see how majestically she is going and now she is going to take a turn and align itself. This is a very sharp uh, turn as far as an airship is concerned. So there you go, coming into land. You can see some water is being dumped on the back side, correct? As I mentioned to you, they want to make it a bit light. Now there are people on the ground who are lining up to catch the airship as it comes down. So they have dumped some water. Again you can see some water being dumped on the back. So the airship is trying to slowly align itself towards the mast. Some lifting gas was dumped and therefore it became uh, heavy. So therefore the water was being dumped to maintain the balance. Now ropes have been lowered from the gondola behind the engine.
the ropes are being grabbed by the ground crew members. There you go, it catches fire. The fire starts from the rear side and quickly moves to the front side. Okay, see it is spreading, the envelope is catching fire. And you will see people jumping to the ground from the aircraft and running away. This is how they save their lives. By jumping out, you can see still there are some people jumping out. Even though the aircraft is fully on fire, people have managed to jump out and run away from the airship to save their lives. Okay, so there was an investigation which showed that there was an explosion in the cell number 4 and 5 junction on the rear side, okay, as per the eyewitness accounts. So there are many questions people have. Why did the explosion start? Okay. Why did the fire spread so fast? Okay, there was an explosion, it caught fire, but why did it spread so fast? Could have been uh, avoided by some means. Okay. So then there are many theories. One theory was that there was a bomb blast or sabotage. Uh, by some undesirable elements. This was ruled out because CIA investigated and there was no suspicious material or explosive material found. So this is ruled out. Then the next thing was, was there a fuel leak? Okay, because the bottom of the airship had 88,000 liters of diesel. So if there is a fuel leak, it can really be a problem. But diesel is not something that catches fire very easily. There is a very high flash point. And the engines are external, they are not lying inside. So there is no way that the diesel could have been heated up because of the engines. Fuel tanks are separate, engines are separate. Secondly, the fire began from top, not the bottom. The engines are in the bottom and the fire began from the top rear side. So this fuel leak is also ruled out. So then, is it because of hydrogen combustion? Okay, if hydrogen escapes from the, from the envelope, and it mixes with air, there is no problem, but you need spark. Now, there was an eyewitness account which said that just before the fire, they saw some fluttering on the top of the envelope. Okay. So, I will show you a small video. This is an animation of what the eyewitness account has said, that some such thing was seen on top of the envelope before the envelope caught fire. Okay. This is called as fluttering. Now, based on this particular account, there was some speculation that was there a leak in the hydrogen gas cells and did the hydrogen leak from the envelope? So, it was seen that the gas cells are made up of plastic, which is sandwiched between two layers of cotton. Okay. So, did a gas cell rupture? That is one big question everybody has in their mind. Second thing is, how did the explosion start? Okay. The gas bag may have ruptured and with that the gas will be released. But for it to catch fire, there needs to be a spark. How did the spark come? So, notice that there were lots of bracing wire to uphold the structure. Each of these was made up of 3 millimeter thick steel. And there have been records in the past that under the structural stress, some of these wires also broke as seen in the previous records. So, this is our hypothesis. So, we say that there was a lot of stress in the bracing wire and because of the stress, it snapped. When it snapped, there was a huge whiplash and that whiplash effect ruptured the gas cell. So, if, uh, if, a, if a wire under load snaps, it will not just fall, it will go with a huge reaction. And in that reaction, if it hits the envelope, it is quite possible that it can rupture the gas cell. Okay. So, why did it happen? It happened because of the peculiar flight profile that the pilots were forced to follow. Remember that at 7 p.m. they were approaching the mast site and they came between the two masts. So, they had to go around. They had to go once again round. And there were a sharp left turn and a sharp right turn during its trajectory for it to be able to meet the um, direction of coming back to land. Now, we are, we know that this airship was not designed for very sharp turns. Okay. So, now why did the commander make these turns? Because, as I mentioned, they were late by half a day. 
due to bad weather and late head winds okay there was a huge event the uh, the coronation of king george 6 of england so there were many guests who were waiting to go back to england using this airship so there was a pressure to land quickly if you do another go around there will be more delay there will be more time pressure so this is our problem in the haste to land the airship the pilot encountered or did sharp turns the sharp turns first on the left then on the right created a huge stress on the bracing wire okay and then bracing wire snapped when it snapped then it gave a whiplash effect which ruptured the gas cells to which it finally went and then once you have a rupture because of the flash back of a huge uh, wire then the load can be very high so the airship can start losing a gas because if this is the case if this is the area where there is a cut then the gas will come out as it comes out it will create the flooding on the top because the envelope on the top it will resist its motion so locally you will get lot of fluttering and that justifies what people have seen also if you lose gas from the tail side then you will become tail heavy because nose will be lighter and that is what we saw in the video also the airship is coming down with the tail with the nose up and tail down and also you notice some water was thrown right okay so let us have a look at how did the explosion start we will see a video of the animation of how the explosion probably started so notice water is being dumped because you have to maintain the buoyancy or lift more than weight there is the water this snaps and there is a huge whiplash effect because of that whiplash effect there is a tear in the envelope around 8 minutes before the actual arrival time the pilot went some water because the airship is heavy the airship is heavy because some gas has gone here is one sharp turn and before he could register there was another turn okay so sharp turn led to stress on the bracing wire with snaps the flash effects and the fire the fire started now how did the fire start the fire started because you have come through thunderstorms so the envelope has gone through clouds therefore it has got a charged uh, profile okay it's already charged positively and then you must have seen some lines were dropped to the ground when the airship came into land those are the mooring lines so the mooring lines were dropped to the ground okay so the surface pressure of the earth became zero because there is earth so therefore there will be uh, there will be a direct uh, discharge of all the charge from the envelope surface to the ground but this is not so straight forward during rains because during rains there is a problem there is a metal on the airframe and there is a linen on the outer skin okay metal is a good conductor this is a bad conductor potential is zero or earth immediately that in the moment you connect to metal and put it to earth there will be zero earth voltage whereas potential will not uh, when the skin reaches the airframe at that time potential will not be zero but with the places where it doesn't touch the airframe that place the potential will be the same so what is it you have a look at this this is a place where the skin touches the airframe and the airframe has got some potential so it will convey the charge but there are some areas between patch where the skin does not touch the airframe okay so therefore these are areas where skin doesn't touch the airframe it has a non zero potential and this causes a spark so because of collection of water at specific locations there was a question 
that there was a spark generated. So then some experiments were done to check that what happens if there is a non-zero potential on the body and zero on the earth. Yes, you can see a charge jumps through. So this validated that the hidden disaster happened because of the charge. So the thunderstorms led to the surface being charged. Moving lines were dropped when earthing of the frame was conducted. Then there is a potential difference between the airframe and the outer covering because of this spark generated. This spark ignites the leaked hydrogen and causes explosion. Okay. So you can see a small video. You can see now there is a charge at all the places in between where the water is collected there is a charge and all the areas where there is uh, fabric is connected. So here they are trying to simulate the conditions in the laboratory. Okay, so this test was conducted in the laboratory and it showed, you can check this YouTube video. Okay, you can see in the video also the spark was created. So, here is an experiment that they are doing. So, they have recreated the Hindenburg structure and they have also installed a similar of course, this is a model, this is not a full scale. Full scale is very expensive. So, this is the structure that they have made. Just like the one that was there in Hindenburg, similar thing. And they also tried to carry out the experiment. So you will see now some spark being created. So you see it starts catching fire, starts burning. Now they are going to inspect it. So we see that even when you put it to a fire, it doesn't explode. So why did Hindenburg explode? Okay. So how did it start? So most people saw from the bottom, but he saw from the front. Because he was on a hill. So he saw on the front. And second before the explosion, he saw something at the tail. Blue flames on top of the rudder. Okay. Now, this is called as an Elmo's fire. This is luminous plasma, which is a corona discharge from leading edge surfaces. You can see this 
whenever there is atmospheric field and whenever there is an electrical conductor with limited length the edges start illuminating so the question here is did saint elmo's fire a natural phenomena ignite the leaking hydrogen so is it possible here to have zero potential on the top you are non zero potential on okay suppose there is a corner of star here theoretically it is possible for electrical spark to be created and then because that is leaking it can be done so you can see this video it shows this particular phenomena called as saint elmo's fire there you can see you can see some spark being created there and then it will be come clear in the night time when it is dark it will become clear there you see spark gets created these sparks can ignite the hydrogen if it is flying okay so this is where there is a ventilation shaft inside gas is escaping and you have central moose fire that became the ignition point it went and ignited and then it blasted so let's see what happened in the trial Let us see when they give this. What happens to the flame? There you go. You can see. Okay, so this is a very interesting video that explains how things went. You can see in this video the testing. ठीक है तो अभी दोबारा चालू होगा कि नहीं
Okay. We showed some video which we took from YouTube. So I simply stopped the broadcast. Okay. I think we can go there. पीपीटी बंद कर दिया तो अभी क्या करें Thank you for the speech. 